Okay, I think we're recording, so we should be good to go. Um, welcome everybody to the first ever community roundtable. My name is Josh, and uh, I'm with the CiviCRM core team. Um, this is an initiative between the community council and the core team, and it's really intended to provide a sort of periodic forum uh, for updates and general community engagement. Uh, I think we're planning to do these quarterly. Um, however, this is brand new, so the format and everything may change, so just bear with us. Uh, today's call, pretty straightforward. We'll do some housekeeping, uh, followed by some updates from the community council and the core team, and then really just open it up to Q&A, okay? Um, it is intended to be fairly informal. However, a few quick ground rules that I think everybody is now aware of thanks to the pandemic and adapting to this new form of communication. Um, first, please stay muted if you're not speaking and that'll help address any background noise. Um, we are budgeting 60 minutes for the call. I'm sure we can run over that a bit, but uh, please do try to be succinct with questions and feedback to allow others to participate. Um, obviously, see a lot of fam familiar names on this call, which is great. Um, but please do a brief introduction before speaking, name who you're with, maybe where you're, where you're located. Um, there, we should post links and resources in the comments section for your reference. I just posted, for example, the PNL statement. Um, if you have feedback or questions, you're welcome to post in the comments section as well. And unless I'm missing something, I think that's pretty much it for the housekeeping section. So. Uh, of this call, so I'll turn it over to Mikey for an update from the Community Council. Uh, good afternoon, or well, well, good time of day. Um, I'm going to share a bit of this with um, Eric, partially because one of the subjects we cover here is around decision making in Community Council, uh, S3, um, and Eric is a passionate advocate for S3, um, so best to let the, the person explaining has the most knowledge. Kicking off, um, we as a community council were aware that we're probably slightly overdue on our elections. Uh, they should have been April, um, and we're kind of coming to the tail end of April. COVID has kind of knocked everything back for a bit, and we've had other things come up that have distracted us. Um, so we haven't got them in as timely fashion as perhaps we might have liked, but we are stepping on the gas with elections at the moment. Um, that's, we're forming a team to kind of spearhead and drive forward the elections. So that will be one person on the community council currently who is stepping down, so not going for re-election, that's myself. Asia, who was on the establishment committee that preceded the community council, has graciously volunteered to help us bringing his knowledge of the previous process without which we'd be flailing in the dark and very confused, sorry, more confused. And Alice, who's staying on the community council, will also join in. Um, and we're going to ask the core team to nominate someone to kind of chime in from their end so that we have, you know, a good representation to help drive that process and make sure it's overseen fairly and in a balanced way. Um, that's about it for the elections. We'll have more communication once the balls start rolling. Um, on that, so do keep an eye on the blog, and we'll be sending mailings out uh, as we approach dates and know what we need to do. Just to share and provide a little information, um, you may have been aware recently of some controversy around the Free Software Foundation and Richard Selman. Um, it's been a bit of a charged issue. Um, and in, there's been some polarizing opinions on both sides, but as a community, it's been a great example of how people have pulled together, had a respectful discourse and some respectful disagreements, but actually handled themselves in a way that is exemplary in, in the world of online communities, in my experience. The Community Council did a bit of the same exercise that the community itself did internally. We had a fairly robust debate, we had lengthy discussions, and we reached a consensus position that we put out as a statement, which I've linked in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I raise this as an example because our decision-making process on this was considerably slower than some other communities, like, like 
Drupal, um, FSFEU. They got statements out much quicker. Than but I think our slightly slower but more collaborative process was actually a real strength because we, whilst we didn't say everything we'd like to have said, there were some of us who would have loved to have just put a blog post up saying, kick him out and be done with it. You know, we don't like him. Uh, that's that's not the position of the community, which is what we try to represent and try to bear in mind. So we have a diverse community, it's a strength. And we have to represent that when the community, when the council speaks as the community. Um, so yeah, that was just interesting. I think it's worth highlighting so people can read the statement. And I'm going to pass it over to Eric for some information on S3. I'll do a little bit of background first. Um, one of the challenges, if you, if you like, we have as a community is that we're a democracy. We're a, a scratch your own itch is the main uh, driving paradigm, <clears throat> which is in total contrast to any of the organizational theories we all grew up with. We'll tend to be hierarchical and simply don't work in that kind of environment. And uh, one of the questions that came up during the last uh, CIFI summit in Barcelona was try and investigate different ways of working together, uh, uh, structures that promote our kind of working together uh, uh, ethos. And I think the one, personally, I think the one that reflects the way we work best is called Sociocracy 3.0. Anyone who's interested should uh, Google that term and they'll, come, they'll see all sorts of introduction videos and YouTube and tutorials and wikis, etc. But the, the main thing is that it's kind of um, driver oriented. So rather than set up a structure and then deal with the issues you have uh, in that structure, you start with your issues or drivers, as they're called in the S3 world, and then organize yourself flexibly around one of those drivers until the driver is solved. So the organization is much more fluid and driven by the challenges we have as a community. Um, we've all, I've also discussed this with, uh, with Josh as a, a, from, a, if you like, a working perspective, and we think it's a good idea, we're going to investigate further, to, uh, as a community council and core team, kick off with a list of, we think these are our drivers, these are the challenges we face as a community. And anyone in the community can then say, well, I would like to run with one of those drivers, organize something around it, and fix it. And one of the things we did as an example was the uh, digital developer sprint, sprint, which we did last week, where the driver was actually on a high level that as a community, we need to be strong in attracting new people because we need new bodies to keep refreshing ourselves. And one of the sub drivers in that was we have to make sure that our documentation is up to date. So I picked up that driver, if you like, organized the digital developer sprint, and we've done some stuff in the last week. So that's the kind of thing we've got in mind, where rather than trying to organize a structure, we actually list and open up for discussion uh, a, a bunch of drivers we think are valid at that point in time in the community. So if you're interested want to know more, give me a shout or uh, look up Sociocracy 3.0 and you'll find some more background information. Just counterpoint very slightly from what Eric said is I, I have the nominal title somehow. I think I volunteered at some point accidentally or on purpose of the documentation working group lead, uh, which seems to encourage people to come to me and ask for permission to do things for documentation. But actually, I think I had a discussion with Eric when we were talking about these kind of S3 drivers and how it works. and. I think I very quickly kind of came to the same realization as Eric, which is everybody in the community should feel powered to just just organize something and get your hands stuck into the documentation. You do not need permission from a working group lead or whatever. And I'm in favor of retiring those titles and, and the, the working group nomenclature because I don't think it serves us. I think what serves us best is people feeling empowered to just say, this week, I will to write about how to build an extension. I'm going to go and do it. All the tools are there and you know you should feel free to, to, to poke me or to poke someone else who has experience with documentation if you want to if 
you want to get get, get to grips with it, if you want an overview of how it fits together. But otherwise, yeah, don't ever let the structure that exists be an impediment to doing things. Uh, we will have time for questions after Josh has given us the core team update. So I think over to you, Josh. Okay, cool. I'll try to move through it pretty quickly. So uh, for the core team update, I just want to touch on some general points, uh, touch on the financials, and then uh, talk about what we're working on now as well as over the next few months. Um, a couple general points. Uh, currently, we're at six, uh, six members operating mostly at the same capacity uh, that we ended 2020 with, and that that sort of averages out to approximately 2.9 full-time equivalents. Um, we do use some contract labor on more maintenance-oriented uh, issues. And with that, I think we're around 3.1 full-time equivalents. So uh, still a pretty small team, if you will. Uh, most of this is uh, technically oriented capacity. We've sort of pulled back from uh, the general project management in favor of development work. Uh, just looking at my notes here, we don't really anticipate any significant changes to our capacity. Um, though we do have some momentum behind Search Kit and Form Builder, we would love to we would love to pick up more development capacity to really try to drive those projects. Uh, monthly releases uh, continue. No foreseeable changes at present. Um, general feedback from community members is, is that these have been pretty solid. Uh, regressions have been identified and, and addressed fairly quickly, uh, so that's fairly positive. Uh, we have had one major security release so far this year, and I think another is imminent. By imminent, I think that means tomorrow, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So just FYI, if you weren't aware of that. Um, much of the first re uh, security release was actually funded uh, by an uh, uh, organization based in Germany called GIZ. They've been piloting CVCRM for various uh, NGOs in their area, and they're very focused on security. It's kind of significant because that was one of the first times we've we've really had a significant amount of dedicated funding on security. So that was pretty cool. Okay. Okay. So I'll shift over to the financials uh, real quick, and I did paste a link to the PNL statement that we've provided. Um, that includes the first quarter of 2021 and also a couple comparison periods, uh, I think three comparison periods back into 2020. Um, if you're looking at it, you can see that Q1 was positive, mostly thanks to earned income, uh, which was specifically funding for projects like uh, Search Kit, as well as funding for security, as I, as I just mentioned. Um, likewise, in the first quarter, we do typically see a bump in community support from partners and members. Um, and we see, uh, we see a bump up in our revenue share agreements um, as they tend to result from donations processed in the fourth quarter, which is uh, uh, typically a strong fundraising season. So all that's kind of come together to make a, a pretty nice uh, first quarter. Um, even though we've had four quarters in a row that are positive, um, we do tend to see revenues uh, flatten or fall as the year progresses. So we do expect to see some negative months and maybe even negative quarters ahead. Um, it could be offset by earned income, uh, but really we don't have much visibility by, behind uh, the next quarter. So we, we sort of know where we are for the next three months, but beyond that, uh, we don't have very good visibility. Uh, partner revenue is uh, down just a little bit, uh, but interestingly, we've seen a, a handful of new partners come on board completely unsolicited, um, such as Full Host and Gripe Digital, both based in Canada, uh, and very recently, a company named Octopus 8, which is based in Singapore. I think that's our first ever partner in Singapore, so that's pretty cool. Uh, because our focus has been much more development-oriented in the past year and less on project management, our efforts to, to directly solicit new partners has lagged a bit, but we do want to pick that back up and, and try to uh, grow that partner program. Likewise, member support continues to wane. Uh, you can see in the, the numbers on the PL, we do, do vacillate between rebooting this program versus sort of pushing more towards the, the make it happen campaign uh, style of 
of outreach to end user organizations to, to try to get them to support the project more. But even, even the Make It Happen campaigns, you can see, have sort of been dwindling and historically they've been um, difficult to, to, to succeed with, if you will. Extended security release is stable, but mostly plateaued. Um, funding initially was driven by end user organizations. However, that's really shifted more towards uh, partner support, thanks to uh, our biggest sponsor, Back Office Thinking. Thank you, Paul. Um, as well as other sponsors like Square and Plante Technology Cooperative have, have uh, really pitched in to make ESR uh, nice. Um, it is currently a six month release cycle. Again, no, no real uh, expected changes in that. Spark uh, continues to grow marginally. We're working to, to bring greater recognition and promotion to it. We've seen about a 5% growth since the beginning of the year, uh, since we last reported in January. Feedback tends to be pretty positive from users. Likewise, we do still see fairly consistent adoption from organizations that stop using Spark. They tend to, uh, I think, somewhere between 11 and 14% go on to uh, use the full download version of CBCRM. So that's that's pretty positive. And just want to reiterate again, that's really the fundamental purpose behind Spark is we sort of view it as a mechanism to fuel community growth. All right, so what we're actively working on. Um, so two big initiatives that we're working on right now, which we actually established as priorities back in 2015 are API v4 and form builder. Um, API v4 is seeing wider usage in the community and, and Coleman and Eileen uh, continue uh, to spend a, quite a bit of time building it out. Form builder has sort of been the dream of Civi CRM for many years, even before 2015. Uh, but it's seen some recent improvements, mostly thank to, thanks to the work on SearchKit. Uh, we've also gotten a lot of recent feedback on features that would make it uh, pretty valuable for the, the community. So we're, we're interested in pushing that. Both are maturing pretty quickly. We are seeing more uptake in the community in general, which is great. Of course, more is better. Uh, so we're hoping to, hoping to really drive those. Naturally, we, we do expect to put more effort into Form Builder in the coming months. Um, once we get two other priorities that are on our plate sort of taken care of and shipped, that search kit, um, which is shipping in core right now, but in beta, it's very close to shipping a stable. Uh, I think we've got a, a couple more months on that, and it'll be pretty feature rich. Um, we're also doing a small project on some workflow improvements around message templates, and hopefully that'll be wrapped up in June. Um, one item that was on our priority list was UI improvements. We've seen traction uh, improvements on that with you, um, excuse me, with the shortage and with the Haystack theme and the Finsbury Park theme. So we're feeling pretty good all in all about the UI uh, progress on the UI. With the search kit and API v4 and form builder now moving along pretty quickly, we are starting to review our next set of major long-term priorities. We should have an update on that probably by the next uh, next community roundtable. Still a lot of work to do on SearchKit uh, and certainly API v4 and Form Builder. And all of these, I anticipate, will remain a focus in 2021 and, and into the next year. Okay. Uh, real quick on the non-development side of things, we're working on a few initiatives, uh, spe specifically content improvements on civicrm.org. Um, we're currently overhauling the contributor listing uh, first, followed by revisions to the partner listing, both of which will be powered by SearchKit, which should be pretty cool and hopefully will we'll showcase some of the power of SearchKit. Uh, we're revising various policies like privacy policy, disclosures, uh, such as publicizing the revenue share agreements, uh, a, lot of, a lot of content improvements on the website that should be coming online pretty soon. Also, still trying to make CiviCRM.org multilingual. That's been a goal for many years as well, but I'm, I'm sensing some interest and in really trying to drive that. That's been a slow, tedious uh, project, but hopefully we can realize it this year. Um, a couple more updates. With respect to Spark, we're working to spin it off onto its own domain at CiviCRM.com in order to isolate its, its message and content for a more targeted audience and uh, and to see if that further 
increases adoption rates of Spark. Um, and finally, we, we're working on a, a more succinct plan for overall project funding in the coming months. We'd like to see improvements in the community support. We'd like to see the, the revenue share agreements grow, and we're really working to address both. Okay, that's just a quick summary from the core team. Obviously, this is just focused on the core team and does include all of the community-driven efforts like improvements to documentation and sprints and the work that's going into extensions. As much as I want to take credit for all of those, uh, those are really you know, community-driven and, and moving along uh, uh, nicely. So this is really just a core team update. I think that's pretty much it for me. So I think we, at this point, enter into the, the Q&A section of this roundtable. So I posted a couple of questions in chat. I don't know if it's worth reading, if you want me to read them or not. I posted one too. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think so. I'm trying to get my screen rejiggered here. Okay. Um, so I'm happy to read my questions. Um, yeah. I asked, does the LLC, so the, the CBCRM entity, does it have a reserves policy? Um, from the financial statements, things look like they're okay now. And as you said, that position changes. So do you have a formal reserves policy that says, for example, the LLC will try and maintain three months running costs, like a non which is fairly standard for a non-profit organization to have? Um, we don't have a formal policy. We have an informal policy that's a bit of an agreement between the LLC owners that says when it hits the three-month cash reserves, we stop taking salaries. And that's that's about as formal as it is. We've done that once uh, since 2016, and uh, we would, we're all committed to doing that again if need be. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, my next question: You, you mentioned 11% of organizations go on from Spark to the downloaded CPCRM. I was unclear: Is that 11% of all organizations who've stopped using Spark, or 11% of all organizations who've ever used Spark? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question, and I, I need to pull the the exact numbers. It's somewhere between eleven and fourteen percent of the users that stop using Spark. Okay, okay. so so those that continue to use it, we don't count those. So those that exit, we're getting somewhere between eleven and fourteen percent. So we're losing like, potentially eighty five percent of them go on to use nothing CPCRM afterwards. That's correct. And okay, so uh, there's an opportunity there. There is. And years ago, a cohort analysis was done by Nicholas at CiviDesk that was something similar that demonstrated that over a period of three months, about 3% of people that downloaded CiviCRM or 3% of organizations that downloaded CiviCRM uh, continued using it after 90 days. So if we look at it against that metric, we're doing really well. Actually, yeah. but, but you're right. There's definitely room for improvement. Yeah, well, and, and on both sides, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I think I had one last question. Yeah, uh, no, two. <laughs> um, you mentioned the core team currently looking, reviewing your priorities for kind of what's post for builder search kit. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a plan to ask the community to input on those priorities? Um, or, or, or is that something that the core team are undertaking solely themselves? Um, at this point, we don't have a formal plan. Um, absolutely not opposed to it at all. It's more, I think we made the mistake previously of listing it as the roadmap on CVCRM.org. And really, it's more about what are, what are our own priorities? Like, where, where do we see uh, the project going and where do we want to, to put our resources? So it's a, it should be a bit more informal, and I'm intentionally not saying a roadmap, instead saying priorities here. Uh, yeah, and I agree entirely. I, I also don't like the term roadmap because yeah. people get expectations when they hear that word. Um, exactly. I think that having development priorities is good. Giving the community the ability to, even, even with the world's biggest bright red disclaimer that says, you know, we, we hear your input, but it may not it may not ever make it anywhere near the priorities. You may be shouting into the void, but giving the community the ability to perhaps express what they'd like to see might be something worth considering. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the last one was you touched on reviewing the privacy policies, and I'm hoping that that will include full GDPR compliance for Spark and CPCRM.org. 
Yeah, that's right. So we're working on privacy policies for Spark and and uh, the data uh, data. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. There's a data management policy associated with Spark as well that we need to implement. Uh, data processing addendum. That's it. Data processing. Um, but yeah, they should both be GDPR compliant. And if we delay, uh, if we continue to delay, then we won't have to worry about a cookie policy because I think cookies are going away sometime in the near future, right? So um, I'm kidding. Yeah, it's 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 just it, like on my on my on my on my thing of risks that I have like in the back of my head for cdstrom.org, the fact that we're now almost well five years after the GDPR regulations were finalized in 2016 and the CDCRM.org is still daily processing data from EU citizens without GDPR compliance is socially, ethically, and morally irresponsible. It's a huge risk. But anyway, I'll let Eric ask his question. <laughs> yeah, I've only have one, which is a good bridge from the uh, roadmap issue if you like because it's got to do with language and expectations as well I just noted that we when we talk about the finance from the core team you use the word revenue which in my mind suggests you're a money making organization or trying to make money so I would suggest we use funding or something like that rather than revenue yeah, it seems, for the it's, same reason as not using roadmap as a word yeah noted that that seems reasonable um, we, we definitely sort of straddle that fence if you will, um, as far as trying to make money uh, to help fund the project, but it's, it's a balance, but that's noted. Okay. Uh, I think we've got a question from Neil as well regarding Spark. Um, do, do we know where they go? That's a good question. And so right now the process of uh, engaging Spark users that uh, unsubscribe really is it's an informal outreach um there's no there's no formal survey or anything so it's it's basically uh me doing some informal outreach to understand where they're going uh and why we've got some ideas uh oftentimes they provide feedback on what was missing from civi crm or uh, they indicate that they were evaluating it alongside other systems uh, so we do get some feedback but it's not highly structured the only thing that's really structured is uh, we ask if they are abandoning Civi CRM altogether, if they are continuing with Civi CRM in the full download version, and if so, are they using a partner on the Civi CRM partner list? So that's the only bit of structured information that, that we ask. Uh, and so, like I said, about 11 to 14% continue with it. And I think around four to 5% of those say, uh, or I'm sorry, four to five percent indicate that they are using a partner. Okay. Um, question from Paul: When does the core team expect to support Drupal eight and nine with ESR? So the latest release of ESR is version five point three three, and uh, I would, I would have, don't hold me to this, Paul. I would have to go back and look, but I believe the next release of ESR will support Drupal 8 and 9. I think the ESR problem isn't strictly code based support because mm -hmm. technically 5.3.3 should support Drupal 8. I think we have a distribution problem with how ESR is distributed versus composer workflows. Right, right. Tim, um, Tim was talking about that uh, in the last core team call. Um, I, I will double check with him, Paul, to confirm that, but I, that's my understanding. Okay. Uh, Neil, uh, happy to be part of those exit interviews. That would be great. Um, I can pull you into that. Um, Aiden, a question from Aiden. Josh said there are a few new partners. What is the trend in overall partner numbers? Yeah, good question. Um, we are heading, we're, we're pretty much plateaued uh, at about the same level. Um, somewhere we send, tend to hover between 50 and 60 partners at any given time. We've lost a few over the years, uh, but we've gained probably an equivalent number. 
it feels like, again, the three that most recently signed on uh, were completely unsolicited. There's another one that was unsolicited that's planning to sign on. It feels like there's some interest that has formed. And if I could actually get my high knee in gear and do more outreach, we could probably grow the partner program. I, I feel like the, there's a positive trend in partners right now. Okay. And at, at this point, you don't uh, you don't have to just type in the comments if you want to unmute and ask a question. That's totally cool. Okay. Just a quick question. Yeah, Bruce, jump in. Um, on the member dues, uh, it looks like fourth quarter is about two grand more than the other three. Is that like annual renewals, or is that? Yeah. Yeah. So typically in the first quarter of the year, we see more annual renewals for partners and members. And so that's why we tend to see a spike up uh, for, for uh, those dues, if you will. A uh, question from Paul regarding the Civi Serum stats. We do keep historical data and I'm assuming you mean like, like snapshots in time, right? Like a daily or weekly or monthly. Um, we do keep that data and we have not done any analysis of it yet. Uh, there is an open issue in GitLab and there's been some interest in pursuing that. And I personally would love to see it happen. I think that we would need some, some help, uh, from outside of the core team to help parse that and present it. Could we, could we make an anonymized dump of the data available for analysis? I'm just thinking it'd be fairly easy to throw it into, into the tools to perform some analyses, but I think at the moment the problem is that it contains some slight identifying information like IP addresses, if I'm not wrong. Um, that's definitely a question for Matthew. Um, it, it's my understanding that it's anonymized, that you would have to really, I think he's, I think he has at times tried to figure out how uh, easy it would be to pull specific information out of it and has failed. So I think it is anonymized pretty well. Um, but that's a, that's a question that we should raise with Matthew because to Paul's point, I think it would be really cool to see an analysis of the historical trends right now. We, you know, we just see the total numbers. So, yeah. And we've got tons of like tons of open source tools like Elastic that are built for right. log data analysis. We could have a dashboard that showed city back as far as we have stats, uh, you know, that's realistically, if yeah. we analyze our help desk ticket, it's going back 12 years and it costs us 26 pence a month to run the infrastructure. It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have historical data back a couple of years. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had some hardware failure on the server that was managing the stats. And so I think it only goes back a couple of years. I don't think we can take it all the way back to the beginning of the project, but obviously don't, don't hold me to that. Okay. So next question is my one uh, again. Um, in Barcelona, we spoke about kind of rejigging the partner program so that it was a little more related to how much money you make off CVCRM and a little less preset banded fees. Did that go anywhere? Um, we took a step in that direction by, if you go to the website, uh, cvcrm.org slash become hyphen a hyphen partner, we took a step that direction in recommending that if, if you're a, a provider using Civi Serum, we, we recommend 3% of your, your uh, revenues go to support the project. Um, and then it sort of stopped at that. I think we had some technical hurdles on how best to implement that. Um, I do think we're still open to it. We're obviously still using the fixed models. Um, but we've also got some mixed feedback from partners. Some really like the the fixed uh, partner dues, um, and they like to put uh, money in other areas like uh, ESR sponsorship or event sponsorship. The one common thing that most all partners have said, you might not be surprised, is that it's cool that the dues haven't been increased in a while. Um, that allows them to sort of to pay in a little bit, but then also, you know, most partners are, are not stingy and they, they do uh, give in other areas of the project. 
Um, so there's no formal plan to move all the way forward with that yet, Mikey, although um, it, it, it is an option if we want to continue. Any other questions? I feel like you're talking, Neil, but. No, can't hear you, Neil. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so, so not so much a, a question, more as a, sort of, as a comment feedback. Um, seems to me that, that things are in a, a pretty good state uh, at the moment. And I think you know, all the stuff we're seeing around search kit and Apple and API 4 and so on, really feels like we're paying some good attention to the, the core of the product. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's great we have lots of other stuff going on, extensions that other people are contributing, but that the core is, is still essential. Um, and that, that all seems, you know, seems seems good. And uh, I think there's, there's been some good communication around that. It's been, you know, the different things that, um, you know, we've had presentations on that to see quite what's happening. Um, again, it ships out in folders and it's, you know, it's there and it's accessible for people to do stuff. So, um, so I, I think things are, are progressing well in that direction and pretty good state of affairs. And um, the question I did have was was not really on the core side of things, but more in terms of community council. Um, so uh, basically in terms of you know what's actually happening there and um, it's it's obviously been a very weird year for everybody um, but i don't feel i've really heard anything much in terms of what community council have actually been doing and thinking about or considering um yeah the rms bit is, is recent in the last few weeks uh, but going back before that not really conscious of anything much that councils actually been doing would be just really well you're right. It's it's we've been we've been pretty quiet. Um, um, you know, hands up. We've we 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 haven't communicated possibly as much as we could, and I think there was a general reluctance, perhaps among the community council, to communicate what was essentially the process of being the first ever community council. So we spent an awful lot of time figuring out why we were there and what we were doing, and then how to do it. Um, so that, that that was probably a good portion of, of our first 12 months um and it's it's been a fascinating journey and i think we're all mindful that what we do and how we conduct ourselves kind of lives on in in infamy because we're the first ever community council we we're, we're, we're the first people to have that have that name have that responsibility and so it's equal parts terrifying and really humbling um in terms of what we've done um concrete actions little nudges behind the scenes stuff setting a foundation and kind of working out where we fit with the core team to try and build a lasting partnership so that our work with the core team is about working with them as partners and not against them or in any way and you know important to say this as clearly as we can as many times as possible we in no way oversee or control the core team or the core product of cpcrm or what direction it goes in we're solely responsible for the community um, the, the software side of things and development side of things is all the core teams, and we don't we don't want to interfere with that, and we wouldn't want to. We we just don't want. We wouldn't want to. Uh, they they do an admirable job with limited resources. What have we got coming? Uh, we're going to have a major community survey um, within the next six months, so that that will be aiming to survey every stakeholder group that makes up the. CCRM community, from the core team to the community council itself, to partners, to community members, to end user organizations. We want to bring in all of their views with targeted questionnaires for each group so that we can come up with a position and and an output that gives us an idea of what the community's priorities are and where they think CCRM should be going as a community and as a piece of software. So that's exciting, and we've got a, a group kind of designing that questionnaire that has members of the community council driving it, but with a really good crew of people from the community, down to people who've been in the community for, you know, in, in real terms compared to some of us, they've been in the community five minutes, but they use CVCRM every day, clicking around in the user interface. So we've got we've got people from all levels of CVCRM experience designing the questionnaire. So 
I'm confident it's going to be awesome and it's going to be multilingual. Um, so that's something we're, we're, we're definitely hot on, and we're gonna we're gonna have that out in the next. I don't know Joe's exact time scale because Joe's leading, but I'd say within the next six months for sure. And then we've done a lot of discovery work on S3 and, and how we make decisions and what tools to make decisions. Um, we, we we waded into the FSF controversy. Um, that was an eye-opening experience. Um, yeah, I think. For me, individually now, I'm not talking on behalf of, of anybody else, I'd like us to have achieved more. Um, and, and at times I felt a bit frustrated because I'm like, what have we actually done? But then I look back on it kind of with the benefit of 12 months hindsight, and I think actually coming into this, it's not like we came into this like politicians with a manifesto that said, this is what we want to achieve for the next 12 months. So we had to take time to figure that out. Um, and you know, having um, having having a bunch of disparate views has been really helpful. We've got people on the community council who made us realise that actually we failed to explain to people coming into this community new. We failed to explain what the team is and what the community is and what the community council is and how these blocks fit together to form something that can produce something like city ceremony at the end of it. So I think that's been a real learning lesson for me in that actually I think our basic explanations of how we all fit together and I need some work. And I'm starting to work on that with uh, Alison from the Community Council in the next week. So yeah, some exciting things. And as Neil says, we addressed use of domains and some trademark disputes with the court team. Um, so we, we helped Josh by uh, kind of, well, I think we helped Josh. Um, Josh and the uh, Community Council work together to help resolve some trademark issues around use of CBS area and top level domains. That was interesting. Also, I think to add, um, I think we were all pretty ambitious when we started. But the reality, of course, is that each of us is fairly busy and we meet for an hour once a month and then we do some additional stuff. But actually, we're not full time community council members. So the amount of things we can do. Uh, is a lot lower than the ambition level we had at the start as individuals. And you can see by Neil and Mighty's uh, last that they recognize this. Um, and I think I said at one point, one of the most important achievements that we've made is that we are. There is actually a community council and people seem to find uh, their way every now and then. There is discussions uh, amongst ourselves. There are people in the community council who have not been involved in the community anymore, who open our eyes. And one of the things that we plan to do in, in, in the remaining time is make sure that there is one spot where a new person can find information on who's who and how do the horses run and, and how do you get an issue raised and how do you get a, a PR done. All kind of information which is there on GitLab somewhere if you search long enough and hard enough. But really there should be a, a, a better provisions for newbies in the community and that's something that we are hoping to to get to. And I think we're a little more realistic about the time we've got available and what we can achieve in that time. Thanks, Eric. Uh, one thing I would say is obviously we're coming, we're coming into elections. Um, and I would encourage everybody to, to, to stand if you feel you've got something to represent for the community. As, as Eric says, in reality, it's a very small time investment. But actually, we need to continue what we've had quite strongly in the first community council is we need representation from right across the um, right across the spectrum essentially um, we need people who work with CBSRM daily and the user interface but have no knowledge of the technical background of city they've got to be in the community council because at the end of the day they're the largest single segment in the community and the one with the quietest and most underrepresented voice um, you know, if we think of the number of people interfacing CPCRM, by far the biggest group are the people who spend their day creating events or creating contacts. But we have the fewest people kind of in that group in the community kind of representing voices because we naturally, we're, it's a developer heavy community because 
originally the community organized around developing the software, not using the software. Um, but yeah, keeping that representation balanced and making sure all perspectives feed into that community council is a way to keep it strong and representative. So do stand if you feel you've got something to offer, please stand. <coughs> I've added one request for feedback from the community, if you like. Um, because we're all elected members, some of us are elected for one year, others for two years, because we want the establishment committee to decide that we should not swap the entire community council, that makes sense. From now on, if I remember correctly, everyone will be elected for two years. Uh, one of the questions that we, we, we came up with ourselves is, sorry about the dog. Suska, here. He makes a valid point. Absolutely. Um, what do we do with community members or council members who, who uh, uh, are elected for years but do not attend meetings regularly? Do we think as a community that that's fine and acceptable or do we think we should set a limit or something like that and then say someone loses their seat after some time? Any reactions? Uh, yeah, the initial reaction is that's very disappointing to hear that people have been elected to it and they're not bothering to show up. We can um, say that. that. It might be a hypothetical question. But, okay, but <clears throat> um, it, that, that depends on why they're not showing up, uh, if it's in terms of times or time frames or whatever, and inevitably there are some things that people can't get to. Um, so I guess it depends in terms of what sort of reasoning we're talking about there. Um, but fundamentally, if people can't actively participate in in the council, yeah, they shouldn't be on there. Any other reactions? I'm not, uh, I can see that, that some formal rules might help uh, prevent a problem where people are in the community council, but not showing up anywhere, not being bothered with maybe the CVCM community at all, but having some sort of responsibility. Uh, but at the same time, I think that uh, if you set up rules for that, it also formalizes it. Uh, and I'm not so sure about how big the problem is. If, if there is a problem, like if you have like every community council so every year, like the two or three people in a, in, a, in a situation like this, then that might help if we have some sort of rules up front before you get elected up, so that we know what kind of responsibility uh, is, is um, what kind of responsibility you take on you and then uh, what you have to do to keep basically your seat in the community council. Uh, but I think setting the rules is, is quite hard if the problem isn't clear enough. That's what I would say. One of the things that came out during our discussion of this in our most recent meeting was that it, it is quite common for trustee boards, non-profit boards, to have a rule that says if you miss three consecutive meetings and you don't have a reasonable reason why you couldn't attend, you know, if you're dealing with long-term sickness or bereavement, or if you do, there are many reasons why actually it's perfectly reasonable to not attend meetings. It's a voluntary position. But if you're not attending just because you're not attending, then perhaps, you know, perhaps having a rule that says if you miss three consecutive meetings and you don't provide apologies or you don't give, you know, a, a good reason, and that's again subjective, which is problematic, then then you forfeit your position. But if we were to introduce this rule, uh, and again, this goes hand in hand with Eric's second point, which is if someone chose to step down mid-term, what do we do as a community and how do we fill that, that gap, that vacancy, that position? Do we do things like runoff elections? Does that mean we need a standing body that comes together to coordinate elections if we need them? Because at the moment we kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's somewhat ad hoc. When we need an election, we kind of put together a group and we, 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 we pull together an election. But it's, we, we don't have a, a standing set of arrangements for this. I can see that as 
wel een, uh, my personal experience with in a similar situation like that is uh, if in my church, I mean the, the church leadership team, as you might say, uh, and I'm elected for a four year period. Uh, and basically what happens there is now and then people step down because they have all the priorities, all the things that uh, if it is one in a year's time, we wait till the next election round and then we have an extra position for that election. But sometimes it's like two or three who step down. Sometimes it's more people stepping down because the way the leadership thing is collaborating together isn't working out that well and there are too many issues, etc. And the people step down and feel a little bit too burdened of the issues and the troubles within the leadership team. Um, and every sort of kind of what the issue is also have its own uh, solution to that. Um, in the years we need to write down things in, in some sort of handbook and have procedures for everything. But every time a situation like this happens, then every time we make up our own rules and then we and then we get some complaints afterwards saying we haven't followed the procedure. Just summarizing some of the uh, chats that's been going on for the recording. There was a, a remark by Catherine to say I would hope they would step down uh, themselves realizing they can't fulfill the responsibility, which makes sense. Um, and there was a question from uh, William Mortada on I would like to understand why they are not attending. I think that to be fair, we haven't discussed that yet with those people. We would like to do that first. We, we just asked for community feedback on the overall issue rather than the personal one. Obviously, it makes total sense to understand why they aren't attending. But also, we thought when this discussion came up, hang on, we should go back to the community. Yes, we're elected members by the community to state what should we in general do with a situation like this. And it is important to say here that we were quite careful when we started this uh, and assume our recollection isn't faulty. We set our meetings on a pattern that just repeated each month. Uh, and that the agreement to that pattern was unanimous. And at no point did anybody come back and say, can we can we open the discussion about the, pat the meeting pattern again because I can't make the pattern. So. You know, I think it, 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 it's always worth mentioning that we did try and design from the beginning that it would be predictable to attend meetings. If you just know what sort of, uh, how, how many we're talking about, the kind of this into this category of not actually attending meetings. Uh, two, realistically, no more than Uh, yeah, uh, I think that we're, we're a body of 12, if I recall. 10, 12, it's bad, I can't remember. 11. 11, that works, yeah. I was, I was in the ballpark. <laughs> yeah. At least I didn't say we're a body of 12, and there's actually 24 of us. That's no. good. <laughs> um, so just rounding off, because I'm conscious we yeah. we're coming from two minutes away. So, so to, to, to round off, we, we, we are certainly going to ask those two people uh, what the reasons are and uh, uh, if they are uh, considering stepping down or uh, re attending meetings, that would be a first thing. But on top of that, I think it's also good to, to and that, that's kind of the suggestion we get here as well, is to have some kind of statement saying that uh, uh, you are expected to attend meetings and, and if if you don't, then there will be a point where discussions will be had. And I think it would be fair to say that uh, context will drive whether we'll have uh, new elections or whether we'll propose a candidate and have the community confirm it or something like that. Because that depends, as you pointed out quite correctly, I think, on the situation and the number of people involved. Thanks for your feedback anyway. I, th I think as well, um, you know, as we're coming up to elections, um, most electoral systems have the concept of attaching a ballot to an all-election. 
So perhaps we could put this as a question as part of the election process, so that at the same time as voting for candidates, people can express, you know, yes, I agree that there should be some kind of process for removing community council members. <coughs> then at least then we have some kind of steer for the next community council who are about to come in to say, okay, so one of the things you, 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 you need to do is kind of work out what kind of process there should be for this. I'm going to jump in because we are almost at the hour. Um, and as I said, this uh, this is the first meeting. We do expect these to evolve. Um, so if you have any input on this uh, roundtable, please reach out to me or any to Eric or, or Mikey, and we can make adjustments. Um, but in this last minute or two, if, if you have additional questions, we're here. I'd just like to say from, from, from me and, and from you know people in the community council who couldn't be here that um, thank you, Josh. Um, we kind of we had a very informal discussion about kind of the idea of doing something peculiar as the core the community council. And then the community council kind of dropped the ball and got involved in other things. We're, we're all busy. And then Josh kind of picked this up and came back to us with this almost ready to go, ready baked plan for these round tables. <laughs> That kind of fit exactly what we were looking for. So thank you so much for kind of pulling this together um, and for everything you do for the community. You know, you're you're kind of the invisible person charging headlong into things you're not paid enough to deal with, um, and usually you end up getting the flag from everybody because you're the most visible person. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely, you're welcome. Hopefully these will evolve uh, and we'll we'll see more attendance and more participation. But uh, thanks to everybody for being here. It's good to see you. And uh, I think that's it. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.